Thank you very much for the invitation to be part of your conference. My name is George Hallas. I'm an adjunct senior lecturer at Monash University's Department of Psychological Medicine. I've been asked to address in 15 minutes the impact of COVID pandemic on us as mental health professionals in the hope that maybe some of the lessons we have learned could be translated and adapted to wider care professionals who are often known, as all of us are often known, as the wounded healers. This is historically a very common phrase, meaning that we've drawn on our own personal and past histories where perhaps we've enjoyed uh, more or less good health, but at times also have been seriously uh, the victims or on the recipient end of trauma and adverse experiences, hence the term wounded. And then we've transformed those skills learned from those empathic states to become healers in the healing profession. I'd like to extend that metaphor slightly from the wounded healer to the ruptured therapist. And it'll become obvious, I hope, by the end of the 15 minute talk, why wounded healer is no longer adequate to address the subjectivity that we experience when we deal with families and individuals affected by the pandemic. I'd like to use the metaphor of being in a boat. Here in Australia, and especially here in Victoria, which is experiencing one of the most severe lockdown policies in the world, now at the beginning of October 2020, we are all enjoined to believe that we're, quote, all in this together. Well, the question arises, what is this that we're in? Clearly, we are in the pandemic together, but I'd like to suggest that some of us are in different boats within the pandemic. So some of us might be in very small rowboats that are very sensitive to the slightest waves and jolt us around. Some of us might be in bigger ships, perhaps sailing ships, and some even in ocean liners. Each of us, while we're in a storm, nevertheless, are affected differently. So yes, we are all in it together, but we're in different boats, having very different experiences of what it is like to be in it. So what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes is to offer three sections of severity from the normal, ordinary, let's say smooth seas to the rougher waters, to the gales and hurricanes, and even perhaps tsunami levels where we have life-threatening conditions. So to begin in the first level, we are all in more or less balance in the boat. The boat is either sailing along or we're rowing along and the seas are calm. We've got our frame of reference. We know who we are, we, we know where we are, we know who we're in relationship with in the boat. This gives us a sense of safety, security, well-being. It is this central subjective experience of well-beingness based on safety, security, trust, that starts to be disrupted once the seas around us gets a bit rough. What then happens is first we start to sway. Already our frame of reference is no longer stable. Of course, I'll stop swaying lest you get a bit nauseous. The point here is that once our own center of gravity, our center of safety, our sense of how we take care of ourselves, how we take care of next of kin is disrupted we become subjectively distressed. We are no longer well. We start having degrees of sensations that leave us unwell. This can be unwellness in our body state, literally being nauseous, sick. It disrupts our appetite, obviously. 
the sense of daily rhythm of when we're awake, when we're asleep can be disrupted so that our sleep rhythms become unbearable with inability to fall asleep or waking up with nightmares or early morning waking. The psychological sense of unwellness is that we don't want to be thinking about higher sort of aesthetic situations. We're starting to be more concerned about, will this be all right? When will things settle back to normal? And hopefully they do. So psychologically, we calm down. We reassure each other, oh, that was a bit rough, but everything's all right now. And therefore, we move on to back to our sense of well-being. Spiritually, we may have entered the realm of saying, oh, my God, uh, let's pray a bit. Let's hope that this won't get too serious. And once the little swell, the upset, the stirring, the mini crisis is over, life is back to normal, essentially. This is the most moderate level of being unwell. Let's increase the distress. The swell becomes bigger. The waves become bigger. The boat is no longer stable. We tip much more severely. We start to get distressed and more stressed. And we may even enter states of panic, turning to each other, our paleness, our pulse, our blood pressure, our gut, our internal systems, the autonomic nervous system takes over. Initially, so-called sympathetic panic, fight, flight. Eventually, the parasympathetic, we move into freeze. We just no longer, we may look calm, but in fact, we're in a very heightened state of energy where the fight, the sympathetic, the flight to run away is opposed by the freeze. We no longer know what to do. The parasympathetic comes in and we move into a state of detachment. Now, this detachment is apparently from the outside looking as if we are very calm. We may move very efficiently, move about the boat, preparing perhaps for capsizing even. Emergency procedures are put into place and we apparently are doing well but we're almost in survival mode. We're so far removed from being well, we're so unwell, let's put it this way, for the situation we're in under huge threat, we're doing well enough, but from the balanced state we started the cruise, we're really in serious survival mode. In this state, we earn the label of a number of possibilities in mental health work. Because, of course, this metaphor is how we're feeling in the clinical situation when we're met by someone who's telling us about their COVID-19 survival experiences or their family or friends, where, for example, in the tragedies that I've heard of, they couldn't attend a next of kin funeral. Or at the moment, indeed, my own mum is in hospital and we've only received visiting rights uh, for a couple of hours yesterday, the 1st of October. So up till then, it had to be phone calls where normally next of kin would like to be close to vulnerable, unwell next of kin. There are many other situations, children, families who've got unwell people, children especially, or babies, the whole, whole social network of schooling has been disrupted. And so not only are we feeling the disruptions within ourselves, but we're feeling them at the same time, often caused by the very culture we live in, has discontinued its safe, secure rhythm of functioning. This is where I'd like to use the term, the culture has ruptured. Now, unless we realize that this is another order of severity, we may just say we're in the state of the equivalent of we're burnt out, we're stressed, just give a bit of R&R. &R. If we can take a few hours rest, 
recreation, perhaps distract ourselves, we'll get back to normal. Nothing could be further from the truth. What modern psychology tells us, and by modern psychology, I'm speaking about the last 20 years that is known as trauma and dissociation informed mental health. Trauma and dissociation informed mental health teaches us that we're entering into a very, very high energy state with huge demands on us that will not revert to normal just because we have a bit of distraction and rest. We've moved out of the burnout, the post-traumatic stress or actual stress reactions, and we've moved into an area called trauma and dissociation. If we are directly affected, we are traumatized. And as often said, the bottom line defense, the way to get through the trauma is to become dissociated from our normal regulatory functions. We move into survival mode. In olden days, when Morse code was the signaling system before high power tech, the signaling for this state where ships were in distress or anyone in distress was called an SOS. Three dots, three dashes, three dots on the Morse code, S-O-S. The acronym was Save Our Soul. This is the profound spiritual dimension of when we get into life-threatening extreme states it is beyond the ordinary physiology, although that's the realm I'll stick to, but to make sure that for your conference, you remember that we've entered danger to the soul, SOS. And I hope that that's something that will chime through with some of the other speakers in the days ahead. But to be get back to what it is that is the extreme that we're in, the state is called an existential threat, literally life and death threat. Now, once the person has survived that, let's move to the third part. They are coming to us as counselors, therapists, supporting mentors, supervisors, peer group reviewers, which are all a form of buddy system. None of us can cope with this level of distress extreme life and death existential stress indeed alone. We need to have buddies. I've got fortunately wonderful peer review groups for 25, 30 years I've been part of where we take such extreme stress situations. And this is not only in the pandemic because the pandemic sometimes reawakens, triggers other times of life-threatening extreme stress and makes a complex picture, which is not just PTSD, but what is known as complex PTSD. So now we have a situation where the person that we're dealing with is in a life-threatening situation. They've survived. They are now coming for some sort of support. Here is the final part of the message. Unless we accurately assess and label the disorder and the distress they're suffering from, we miss the boat. We may think they've just gone through a little bit of rough water rather than realizing they've been tipped out and were on the verge of drowning. Indeed, they may have seen some of their fellow travelers drown. So they are witnesses to life and death events. Now, when such a person comes to meet with us, unless we are prepared to resonate, to be attuned, to be way beyond empathic in thought, we are empathic in feeling bodily states. Our subjectivity resonates to their life and death crisis. Hence, when they became dissociated, if we're at this deep level of attunement, we are also at risk of dissociating. This state is known as dissociative attunement. 
The message here is that unless we as therapists, counselors, mentors, supervisors realize that we ourselves have entered this survival mode, although outwardly we're in a consulting room, we don't look as if we're in danger, but by the very nature of our work, we've moved from being the wounded healer to actually experiencing the rupture that our patient, our client has just survived. Therefore, as I said at the very beginning, I like to use the term that we have become the ruptured therapist. The hallmark of the ruptured therapist is all the hallmarks of dissociation. We become depersonalized. We no longer feel our sense of safety, no longer even our sense of identity, our competence, the quality of reward in attending to our clinical work. We are way beyond burnout because it just doesn't, won't be returning to our state of well-being and safety by withdrawal. Our body is in a dissociated state. So the final message is, what do we do when we're in this state? Unfortunately, there is no simple solution. There is the need for very skilled sets of intervention, which are based not on talk therapies, but the understanding of the body's reaction to trauma. As Basil van der Kolk said, the body keeps the score in trauma. It's not just the mind, it's the heart, the lungs, the viscera, the gut feelings. And there are very special skill sets needed to attend to this in ourselves. This is attending to reparative moments in ourselves. So to come back to the very beginning where we sometimes talk about self-care and the safety of the therapist, my takeaway message is when we're dealing with patients and clients in the pandemic setting, either directly affected by the pandemic or triggering past PTSD, we as therapists have to take care of ourselves, not as an option, it's a necessity. If we don't recover from our dissociative attuned states, we risk iatrogenic negative effects. Iatrogenic, that is doctor induced. We as therapists become part of a problem, negative iatrogenesis, rather than part of the solution, positive iatrogenesis. So in summary, we've moved from the very calm waters to the slightly turbulent waters, to the extremes with life-threatening extreme SOS signaling. When we receive such SOS signaling, we ourselves are in high risk waters. It is our duty of self-care. It is our ethical mandate to do no harm, to first take care of ourselves in such moments. It is only through self-care restoring our own unwellness that we can be available to the next moment for the patient's client's life-threatening situation to repair their dissociated state after we've re restored our own dissociated state. There are very many technical issues about how we can do this within a session. Briefly, the first aid is make sure we breathe, restore and recalibrate our own internal safety rhythm. And of course, there are many techniques between sessions to be restorative for the next session, but that's for another talk. So my time I see is up. What I'd like to leave with the message, you with the message, is that our situation has to recognize in the pandemic setting, the SOS signals, not only from our patients, but only from our own bodies. And we have to remember to save our own souls before we can reach out and regularly turn up hour after hour, day after day, to attend to our patients and clients who've survived the life-threatening threats in the extreme 
which is way beyond burnout, moral injury, PTSD. We've entered into vicarious trauma and dissociative attunement. I wish you all safety and pray for uh, well-being and hopefully this pandemic eases and stops as soon as possible and I hope we find a vaccine that will relieve a lot more suffering in the future. Blessings to you all. Thank you.